Seven Investing. I'm Matthew Cochran, a lead advisor at Seven Investing, where it is our mission to empower you to invest in your future. We do that by providing monthly stock recommendations to our premium members and educational content that is freely available to everyone. Listeners, today I am very excited to introduce Value Stock Geek. By day, VSG toils in corporate America, but by night, he's a do-it-yourself investor pursuing financial independence while chronicling his investments on his blog. More than this, though, his approach to asset allocation is very unusual, but extremely thoughtful in what he calls the weird portfolio. Uh, outside of the weird portfolio, he seeks wonderful companies at wonderful prices with an emphasis on economic moats. And you know, I love that. Um, I can't wait to get to this discussion. So let's just get to it. Value Stock Geek, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Uh, thanks for coming. So uh, let's just kind of jump right into it. Um, on your 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 medium page and your blog, uh, you you were saying there was two ways to beat the market. And one was like by picking the asset classes that will perform the best. And you call that like, this is approach like tries to like, you know, this is what Ray Dalio tries to do, the famed hedge fund manager. And then the other way is to pick individual stocks that will outperform. And, you know, this is like the, the Warren Buffett way. So you acknowledge that this is like super hard and that you often fall short, but you kind of attempt to do both in your personal portfolio. Yes. So I've been an active investor for over 20 years. I got interested in the market when I was a teenager. Um, and then in that time, I've come to the conclusion that I am not Warren Buffett and I'm not Stanley Druckenmiller. And I don't necessarily have a great ability to pick the winning stocks and to predict what's going to happen with macro. So um, I did a lot of that speculation throughout my investing career. And the weird portfolio grew out of my realization that that's probably not the best approach for my money. Right. And so, all right, you call it the weird portfolio. And what I like about this, it's very, uh, like, it's very, it, it seems very unique to me, which it, I just love. It, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, like, um, and, and it seems like there's more, maybe an emphasis more on uh, like playing defense as much as playing offense in it. But why do you, let, let's just, why do you call it the weird portfolio? And, and just from a high level, what, what are, what is your goal with it? Sure. So it started where I was realizing that what I was doing with my personal money, where I was flipping a lot of deep value situations and I was speculating about macro, that it really wasn't working. Another realization to it was that it wasn't particularly tax efficient, um, that I was paying taxes every year on whatever I sold and, and whatever I moved a position on. So I wanted an approach that used ETFs, that used the tax efficiency of the ETF vehicle. And at the same time, I had a number of different goals for it. I wanted it to deliver a consistent, relatively high rate of return. I wanted it to have the ability to restrain drawdowns and avoid bubbles. And my search for a good method of doing that started with Harry Brown's permanent portfolio. And for those who aren't aware, Harry Brown's permanent portfolio is a four asset class portfolio where you have 25% in US stocks, you have 25% in long-term treasuries, you have 25% in gold, and you have 25% in cash. Uh, I thought that was lacking in a number of different ways. So I wanted to create my own approach. So my approach is to use five asset classes, which is uh, US small cap value, international small caps, um, long-term treasuries, gold, and real estate. And that delivers a very, it delivers a high rate of return, um, high by my standards anyway, where if you back test it over 50 years, it gets you to about a real rate of return on top of inflation of 7%. Um, not in nominal terms, it's about 10%, 11% in the back tests. Uh, it tends to restrain drawdowns during major dust-ups, and it's done because it's constructed in a way where it's designed to deliver a return in multiple economic environments. And it's set up in a way where I could implement it 
not really have to tinker with it too much. And it's something that I can just pile my savings into and know that it should perform well over a long period of time. Excellent. And so like, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's like almost like uh, the five asset classes you mentioned, small cap, US small cap value, international small cap, real estate, uh, long-term treasury bonds and gold. Individually, those asset classes can be quite volatile. Like if you just took gold, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. Like th there's, there's, there can be a lot of underperformance there, but like together, uh, they have this effect of like almost like smoothing out your portfolio's returns over a long period of time while still delivering pretty decent returns. That's exactly right. Uh, they're all extremely volatile in isolation. So if you were to own small cap value, that's historically been the best perform U.S. small cap value. That's the best performing asset class of all time. It's delivered, I think, a 13% CAGR since uh, the 1970s. Um, that's the way to go. But through that, you have to deal with tremendous volatility, underperformance. Uh, there are some catastrophic drawdowns that you're going to have to deal with from time to time. Gold, same thing. You're going to have situations where uh, gold underperformed for, or delivered negative returns for 20 years and entered a 20-year drawdown uh, from 1980 through 2000. So there are all sorts of environments where these things are doing wild things. But the nice thing is they all tend to deliver their returns in completely different environments. So what you can do is if you're rebalancing this portfolio, you're using that volatility and you can, for instance, buy long-term treasuries when they've run up in 2008. And then you can use that to buy small cap value when it's extremely depressed. Uh, another example would be an environment like the COVID crash in, in quarter one of 2020, where your small cap value was down nearly 60%. But long-term treasuries were up 20%. Gold was basically flat. And then you could use that to rebalance and buy small cap value and international stocks and get more aggressive. Um, and then the net effect of combining all of these volatile assets in a portfolio is that you get a smoother rate of return. Right. Uh, yeah, th th that makes a lot of sense too. Like, um, you know, I think what, what's interesting about this conversation we're having now is like, I think if we talked a year ago, uh, there's a lot of people who would hear this and say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it smooths out volatility, but like I can take volatility. And then <laughs> after the last few months, I think this is a lot more individual investors are going to find this kind of approach more appealing just because of what like the drawdown like some of us have had in our personal portfolios and such. Absolutely. Yeah, I think people overestimate their risk tolerance. I certainly did when I was a younger investor. I took Munger's quote to heart that, oh, you just have to deal with 50% drawdowns and it's not a big deal and it's just part of the game. Well, it's one thing to think about that in theory. It's totally different when you're living through it and you've lost half of your money. Um, so I know that I don't have the, the uh, wherewithal to look at that and not emotionally react to it. So I needed something that restrains some drawdowns and uh, protected. And th the sad thing is when a lot of people have that attitude where they just pile into risk assets that should have high returns over a long period of time, what they tend to do is they tend to time them inadvertently because of their emotional reactions to what's going on. So like JP Morgan did a study where they compared the returns of different asset classes to the returns of your average investor. And what most investors wind up doing is they pile in the risk assets when they're hot and things are going great. And then they get freaked out at the bottom and they sell. And then the net result is they underperform even the most conservative asset allocations that are available. Um, so I think it is important to restrain drawdowns and minimize volatility because uh, we're not all Charlie Munger. I'm, I'm certainly not. Sure, sure. And even like uh, Peter Lynch's uh, mutual fund back in the 80s and 90s, I think they did a, they did a study where like, you know, how uh, like significantly Peter Lynch's mutual fund like outperformed uh, like the the broader index and just how well it did. And yet most individual investors in it uh, did much, much uh, uh, more more poorly than the overall fund's performance because they would they just have this tendency to sell at the exact wrong times and then buy back in, you know, instead of like the buy low, sell high, you know, it's, it's uh, behavior wise, it's much easier 
uh, to just buy high when things are going great and then sell low when things are going horrible. You know, the worst time to panic is usually when we have, unfortunately, we have the tendency to do so. Yeah, we're just wired wrong for our human instincts are just wrong for investing. Like they kept our ancestors alive. You know, you saw something that looked a little bit dangerous. If you ran, you survived, even if it was dangerous or not. The guy who stuck around and was like, oh, let's figure out what's happening here. He got eaten. Um, so we've evolved to really have be extremely risk averse. I have that in me. I'm, I'm very risk averse. I get scared. Um, and then the other, the other aspect to it too, is when you're in one of those drawdowns and you're in one of those big bear markets, um, there's always a good explanation for why it's happening. And it's very convincing for why it will continue. So in, you know, the global financial crisis, it definitely seemed like we were on the, going to have another great depression during the great depression stocks had a, um, 80% drawdown. Um, it was underwater for 25 years. And at that time, it looked like that was a very real possibility. So if you're looking at a 50% drawdown, not only do you have that emotional aspect of it, but there's also an intellectual component where you understand that this can continue and this can get a lot worse. Um, so it's, it's, it's very hard, I think, for an investor to just you know, lock it up in some risk assets and let it ride. Um, it's much easier said than done. Sure. No, absolutely. Um, so that, that raises the question, when did you come up with this? Was it during the financial crisis, like having experienced that? Or was it just like, uh, like what was like the catalyst for you coming up with the weird portfolio? I started moving in this direction about six years ago. Um, at the time, I was doing a lot of deep value, a lot of macro speculation. And it really grew out of being wrong about so many different things and starting to realize that I was wrong about it. Um, I was very much in the mindset in, say, 2011, that the Fed had inflated a crazy bubble in the 2000s. They were just inflating another one. This is bound to collapse. We were bound to have trouble. Around 2015, 2016, I realized that view might be wrong, um, that, I, that I might have gotten that wrong. I also realized that I had trouble flipping stocks the way that I was in kind of a deep value mindset. Um, so I started moving in this direction back then. Then uh, I really started to refine it, I'd say around 2017, 2018, where I really started to aggressively move most of my net worth into this strategy. Um, and then I, I really became, it was almost a, a religious moment during COVID because during COVID, I, my instincts were extremely bearish. I thought, okay, we're going to have another Great Depression. This bubble is finally blowing up. Um, but then I looked at the weird portfolio. I looked at how I was investing. I, made, I said, all right, I made an agreement with myself. I'm going to stick to this method through thick and thin, no matter what. And I'm going to let it ride. And that turned out to be the right decision. Um, and that's when I really became convinced I have no knack for macro. I can't predict any of this. Um, and that this is, this is the way. <laughs> right, right. Well, what's that Peter Lynch quote? It's something like, uh, I might be butchering this, but like if you spend 15 minutes of, on macro each year, you're, you're spending 10 more minutes than you need to or, or something like that. And when you consider just like how if great investors like Lynch and Buffett can't figure out macro, like I just tell myself all the time because I'm fascinated by the subject. But I tell myself all the time, if those guys can't figure it out, then, uh, then what, what chance does a guy like me have? Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Um, I, I too love macro. I love to think about it. I love to speculate about what's going to happen, but it's so difficult to, to predict any of this stuff. And um, experience has taught me that, that I have no talent for it. <laughs> right, right. Well, let's, so let's break this down a little bit. I'd like to uh, just like, if we could briefly go over uh, each component of the weird portfolio um, and just like, I, I think on your, your blog, you were explaining it, like some of this is for offense and like to get, you know, for gains and to get returns. And then some of it's for defense to, uh, you know, contain the downside. So let's just break it down. Um, let's start with U.S. small cap value. I think it's U.S. small. It's not U.S. small cap in general. It's U.S. specifically U.S. small cap value. That's right. And that's, so uh, I think that's 20% of the weird portfolio. So why don't you tell us, like, why did you 
what what made you like choose this in the portfolio and like how does it fit in? Sure. So U.S. small cap value, like I, I mentioned earlier, is the best performing asset class of all time. It's returned 13% since the early 1970s. Um, Fama and French in the 90s identified um, size and, and value as one of the key components that dictate returns. Um, a lot of people think of it in terms of a premium that you get on top of the market. I don't really think of it that way. What I think of it more like is um, it's a steady grind basically through prosperity. You have companies that are expanding their P's. You have companies that are declining in P's and price to book. Um, and basically you're systematically buying the cheap stuff and selling the expensive stuff. And that works over time. Um, there's also an element of risk to it. So part of the return that you get there is the risk because smaller cheap companies are probably going to be junkier and riskier than the broader market. So that's probably an element of the return. Um, small cap value has underperformed in the last decade. But that said, it's still done okay. Um, if you invested in Vanguard's small cap value fund, you still earned an 11% rate of return. Um, if you went back in time and told people 10 years ago that you're going to earn an 11% rate of return, they would have probably said, oh, that's wonderful. But what they didn't understand was that um, large cap growth was probably going to deliver 17% rate of returns. Sure. Um, so, but that's the thing about small cap value. What small cap value tends to do is it delivers that steady grind decade after decade, it delivers a decent return and that turns into a premium. So during the 2000s, small cap value, I think it did like 7%. Um, it also delivered a steady rate of return through the 1970s. Um, with that said, small cap value does have catastrophic drawdowns, but it's usually in reaction to big recessions. So during the financial crisis, you would have had a 60% drawdown. 73, 74, you would have had a pretty significant drawdown. Um, in the early 90s recession, I think you had roughly a 25% drawdown in there. So um, you get that. Um, you get that effect, you get that steady grind, but you are going to have some nasty drawdowns when the economy runs into trouble. Sure, sure. No, I, that, make, that makes sense. And now the second component is international small caps. So how does this fit in? I, and won't this be like, um, you know, when we're talking about volatility, I would think this would be like maybe the most volatile part of the portfolio, like just seems very sensitive to like the global economies. Right. So this was basically trying to take that small cap value and make it global. Um, I'm a big believer, Meb Faber talks about this a lot, that you shouldn't have home country bias, that you shouldn't put all of your eggs in one basket. Right now, a U.S. investor wants to be 100% invested in U.S. stocks because of their performance. Um, that can go wrong. Um, there are times when a market can enter into... Um, and a whole economy can enter into trouble. And my thinking is if you spread your bets out throughout the world, you can um, minimize that risk. So the weird portfolio for the funds assets is basically half US, half global, half international. So um, I would prefer to be international small cap value to make that global small cap value. There weren't a lot of liquid vehicles at the time with a long track record for international small cap value. There are some funds out there that now exist that can do that. Like um, Avantis has some funds that are international small cap values. So that's an alternative. Um, but the Vanguard small cap fund basically delivered approximately the international small cap value return. So that's really the goal there is to have 40% of the portfolio in small cap value. Um, another big advantage of small cap value and diversifying internationally is avoiding bubbles. So large cap stocks in a single country can enter into a bubble and can have catastrophic returns for a decade or two. So I wanted to avoid that um, by diversifying throughout the world because it's rare for all of the markets throughout the world to enter a bubble at the same time and pivot the small cap value, which should avoid those larger cap bubbles. Probably a really good example of this would be Japan where small cap value did fine for the last 30 years while the index melted down from the bubble that happened in the 1980s. So uh, my thinking was that if you diversify internationally, you pivot to small cap value, you'll, you'll avoid those Japan-like situations. 
Right. And this is also, I, I, all five components, I, I believe I'm correct, are, are 20, represent 20%, correct? That's right. Yeah. Okay. And then, the, so the, the third component is real estate. And I think you break this down between U.S. real estate and international real estate. Yep, exactly. Um, so there's two Vanguard funds that I use, VNQ and VNQI, where VNQ is U.S. real estate, VNQI is international real estate. Um, and then there's also some, inter there's global real estate ETFs that do exist. So um, REET would be an example of an iShares ETF that's diversified throughout the world. Um, thinking there's the same, you want to avoid investing in one country because one country can enter into a big bubble. Um, and then real estate is basically um, an asset class that normally avoids bubbles. Um, as we learned in the 2000s, it doesn't always avoid bubbles. Um, but typically, it doesn't get caught up in those kind of large cap, growthy, euphoric bubbles. Um, an example of that would be the late 1990s. Real estate didn't really participate in that bubble. And it was able to deliver a steady return through the early 2000s. Um, and that's mainly because it delivers a lot of its return through dividends. So you get a lot of income through um, REITs. Um, they're required in the US, they're required by law to um, return most of their profits to, to the shareholders. So that's, that's an advantage there. Um, and then on top of that, you get some inflation protection through real estate. So if there's inflation that's going on, the replacement costs of the real estate are going to go up. They will likely be able to increase their rents um, year after year as inflation goes up. So in addition to that, you get some inflation protection. But like small cap value, this is an offense asset class. Um, you're going to get uh, destroyed when there's, when there's major trouble in the economy, whether it's something like COVID or it's something like the global financial crisis. So it's not going to offer total protection. It will protect you from bubbles, but it's not going to protect you from a nasty recession. Sure, sure. And now what would you say though, if somebody's like, you know, uh, I know you do it through REITs, but I'd rather like buy individual properties, like in either, you know, use them as Airbnbs or rent them out to long-term renters. Like, is there a, do you prefer REITs over actual physical properties or like, do you think you can accomplish the, the same goal through either one? Well, there's advantages and disadvantages, I'd say, to both approaches. So if you're doing individual properties, um, one of the big advantages there is you can use leverage, so you can lever up the properties and enhance your returns that way. Um, the disadvantage would be you have to actually manage the property and you actually have to deal with tenants, which is a pain in the butt. <laughs> and then on top of that, you have to, um, you tend to be very concentrated on a certain geographic area. So um, usually it's going to be a property that you can drive to and that you can check it out and you can understand what's going on with it. Um, so that can be challenging as well and present some risk because you never know your geographic area might enter some tr trouble that you might not be completely aware of. Like, let's say you're in, uh, you live in a small town in Pennsylvania in the 1980s, and that town is dependent on a manufacturing plant in the area. Everybody works for that manufacturing plant. And then what happens if that manufacturing plant shuts down? Well, your tenants can't pay their rent, your property values are going to go down. Whereas with um, an ETF, you can diversify globally. You can take it global and diversify that geographic risk. So that's the advantage of the ETFs, I think, is that you can get a lot of uh, global diversification, geographic diversification, and you don't have to actually do the work of managing the property. Sure. No, that, that uh, not managing the property uh, definitely resonates with me. It's just not something I, I really care to do. Um, long-term treasuries. So you have 20% of the weird portfolio to long-term treasury bonds. Now, uh, this is more probably defensive than the first three, uh, sectors we talked about. Um, so like, how does this fit into the portfolio? Right. So long-term treasuries, they do well when basically interest rates are coming down. So you have to think about what are the environments where interest rates are coming down? Um, that's going to be a period of deflation or a period of serious economic trouble. So when did, in the last 10, 15 years, when did long-term treasuries do really well? Well, they did extremely well from 2007 to 2009. 
Um, the Fed was aggressively cutting rates while the economy melted down. Um, they did really well in quarter one of 2020. Um, so the idea is that when there's a recession like that, you're going to have this flock to safety and it's going to be a period of time when long-term rates are going to be coming down. Um, it's long-term treasuries because the longer out you go in duration, the bigger the effect is when the rates are coming down. So you basically get this almost leveraged effect where um, as in these environments where likely your real estate, your um, small cap value is getting annihilated, this ought to deliver some returns, reduce your volatility, and then give you some ammunition to pile into the risk assets. Sure. And so I have to ask, like with interest rates so low and with the Fed signaling that interest rates are going to go so up, like go higher in the next year or two, um, this is where the part of me like would want to tinker with it, with this mm. formula you have. You, you have to have that uh, temptation. So like why hold long-term treasuries now, or especially like, you know, during the peak of COVID when you know, the Fed just slashed interest rates to basically nothing. Uh, you had to be tempted to be like, you know what, right now, let me, let me rebalance or let me tinker with this formula I have. Yeah, well, that's when you get into trying to predict macro. So that's what I want to avoid. So the problem is, even though rates are low, we could still have a nasty recession that could pop up tomorrow for all we know. Um, people, I, I remember in 2008, like the early 2008, the worry was inflation and rising interest rates. It was like, oh, I remember that summer gas prices went up to $4. It was very similar to what's going on today. And then next thing you knew, um, Lehman Brothers fails, the economy is falling apart, and the Fed is cutting interest rates as aggressively as they can, and my risk assets are getting annihilated, and the long-term treasuries are doing well. With that said, I mean, with the low rates, you do get a lower rate of return. Like long-term treasuries aren't going to deliver the kind of returns you got in the 1980s where they were giving you, you know, 10, 15% rates of return because they were paying that huge coupon. Um, but with that said, they're still going to do well. Like I, I find it difficult to imagine an environment where the economy is falling apart and stocks are down 50% and the Fed isn't cutting interest rates or quantitative easing or doing something like that or there isn't a flock to safety to treasuries. So I still own it in there. Same way I uh, pay insurance on my car or my house. Um, you know, it, you hope you never need it, but that's pretty much what it's there for. And it tends to work better over the long run than hedging or going long volatility, which tends to cost a lot in fees, which um, delivers a negative return over a full market cycle. Long-term treasuries, they're almost like a insurance product that pays you interest. That's kind of the way I think about it. Sure. No, that makes sense. But I, I, I had to, it, it just seems like I know I would be tempted for sure to like, okay, well, I don't want to predict macro, but I think I have a pretty good handle on this part of it or right now. And, and uh, I know that temptation has to come in. Uh, and then finally, yeah. gold. So gold makes up 20% of the weird portfolio the, Do you have like, is this gold bullion or, you know, how do you, how do you uh, allocate to gold and how does this I fit do, it? Yeah, I do a little bit of both. So I, uh, I do have some physical bullion, uh, but my exposure is mostly through ETFs. And the thing, thinking of gold is you just have in there a totally uncorrelated asset to stocks and bonds where, um, it's something that tends to do well in the environments when bonds and stocks are doing poorly. So you can have a situation where like the 1970s, where inflation is a serious problem, where rates are going up because the Fed is trying to deal with inflation. And in that sort of environment, gold tends to do very well. Um, and the other aspect of it is gold is extremely volatile. So gold will do poor, tends to do poorly when stocks are doing well and treasuries are doing very well. Um, and then it's also in there as kind of extreme risk management. So if I had to think of an environment where say, for instance, treasuries are becoming worthless because the Fed has lost control over the situation, or if Peter Schiff is actually right and the Fed has inflated some crazy bubble and all financial assets are about to get annihilated, 
Um, if that were to happen, you know, I can look to my gold and say, well, I'm at least 20% of my right. assets are, right, are right, protected right. from, from that sort of insanity. So, um, and then even if you're not kind of a Peter Schiff, mega bear kind of guy, where you're worried about the world, the financial system collapsing, when you do the back test and you do the work, you'll see, hey, this is an uncorrelated asset and in a portfolio, it can work really well. Um, like one of the things I looked at when I was thinking about this was I did a hypothetical portfolio that was 50% US stocks and 50% gold. And one of the wild things I found about that portfolio, if you rebalance it every year, is that it outperforms both stocks and gold with less volatility and less drawdowns, which shows the relationship between wow. the two assets. Yeah, like yeah very interesting. Totally, yeah, totally uncorrelated. Right. Uh, so how often do you rebalance the weird portfolio? So I'm in the accumulation phase of my life. I, I am still saving tons of money every year. So I don't really have to do rebalancing. I put practically half of my paycheck every two weeks goes into this allocation. And um, I basically buy whatever is light. And over time, that tends to bring it back into balance. So that's adv advantageous from a tax standpoint, too, because I don't actually have to realize capital gains. I can just keep piling money into this, buy whatever's light. Um, lately, I've been buying a lot of um, treasuries and international stocks. And I know whenever whatever I'm buying always feels wrong. It felt wrong to buy stocks right. in uh, 2020. It, it feels wrong now to buy uh, treasuries and international stocks. Uh, but... It's usually it's usually the right decision. Usually, what it, what feels wrong is the right. Hello. Yeah, well, I, I lost you for a little bit, but yeah, like yeah, usually ah, that's okay. It usually it does feel weird or, or wrong to buy what you should be buying. Uh, th that's for sure. Um, have you ever considered any other assets? Like, I mean, even as wild as like Bitcoin or crypto or or other assets like energy or basic materials or or commodities. Sure. So um, crypto, I've long been a crypto skeptic. That has been wrong. I've been wrong on crypto. <laughs> so, but with that said, when I look at the uh, activity, the price action, crypto strikes me as a risk. Act. It seems like Bitcoin does really well when risk appetites are high and it tends to do poorly when risk ap appetites are low. So Bitcoin's two big drawdowns were um, in December, 2018, and it had another huge drawdown during quarter one of 2020. So that tells me that this is still a risk on asset and that it's not going to do what gold can do for a portfolio. Um, commodities. So I did consider commodities. Ray Dalio uses commodities in his all seasons approach. Um, my issue with that was when I did the back testing on commodities, I saw it didn't really deliver a positive rate of return over the long run. Um, so there's that aspect of it. Um, it tends to draw down significantly in environments like 07 to 09 or 70, 73, 74. You had, um, they did draw down a bit, even though oil did well. Um, so there's that aspect to it. It's not going to offer the protection that gold can offer in a risk off environment. Other problem with commodities is there's no real easy way to access it. So if you use an ETF, uh, a commodity ETF, they tend to be generating the return with futures. So there, it's not like you're really owning a basket of commodities where in contrast, you can own an ETF that is actually backed by physical gold. Um, so they're generating the return with futures. Um, that also generates K-1 tax forms, which are a pain in the butt to deal with. Um, so that's an issue there. And they also tend to have um, high, higher fees. So I didn't really want to deal with that. Um, so for that reason, I excluded that from my, uh, my asset mix. Sure, sure. Uh, and then finally, like, uh, I mean, like we've already answered this, like it just kind of smooths out volatility. But even like Warren Buffett says, look, just go like 90% stocks or in 10% bonds, or there's the traditional 60, 40, you know, breakdown between stocks and bonds. Like what was like, 
was it was it just dealing with the volatility or do you do you think like this has a chance of outperforming like those kinds of portfolios sure so historically this has outperformed 60 40 and it's delivered the return of the u.s stock market um will that happen in the future i'm not sure um but anyway that said why don't i just do 100 percent or 90 percent u.s stocks like warren buffett recommends well um, I considered that. The problem with that is I think if you're going to embrace that approach, and it's a totally valid approach, you need to be able to handle the 50% drawdowns with, without an issue. Um, you also have to be able to deal with the cycle where occasionally large cap U.S. stocks are going to enter bubbles, and you're going to have lost decades as a result of that. Um, and for that reason, I wanted to avoid just buying the S&P 500. Um, if you have a 20 year time horizon and you're willing to deal with lost decades and occasionally deal with a 50% drawdown, it's a fine approach. Um, but I just decided that that, that wasn't for me. Um, in terms of 60, 40, um, the issues there were, I felt like you needed gold in that allocation in an environment where you had inflation and rising interest rates. Um, 60, 40 has, is, is a fine portfolio. It's done very well over the last uh, 40 years, but you could easily run into a situation where rates are going up and your stocks and bonds are getting clobbered at the same time. So I thought it was important to have some real assets in there, like gold, where um, you have something kind of alien in the portfolio that's going to do something different than the stocks and bonds. And you've seen that this quarter too, where you've had uh, both the stock market and the bond market have had drawdowns year to date. And um, Gold is up year to date, so this is this environment. This current environment is actually a pretty good example of why um, getting beyond stocks and bonds can can help a portfolio and adding something like gold to it. Right. No, that that makes uh, it makes that may, definitely makes a lot of sense. Um, now, this isn't your entire portfolio, and what I like about that, well, one is like, you know, often it, it's it's not the weird portfolio, but like people come and be like should I index or should I invest in individual stocks? And like, it doesn't have to be a binary choice, right? Between uh, individual stock selection or ETFs and indexing, or even the weird portfolio you can do. There's plenty of room to do both. You know, like a lot of times I'll tell people, well, look, match what you have in your 401k first and then do that. And then like, look, if you want to buy individual stocks in an IRA or something like that, or just a, a regular brokerage account, uh, you know, you, you have room to, to, you know, like play with. Um, but like you do also invest in individual stocks. Yeah. So I agree with you hundred percent that you don't have to be all in one way or another. Um, I love picking individual stocks, even, even if I'm not particularly good at it, I, <laughs> I enjoy the hunt. I enjoy learning about companies. Um, I love thinking about what's going to happen with this company. Is this a good investment? That type of thing. I love analyzing companies. Um, so I set aside a piece of my portfolio and I said, this is um, a slice of my portfolio where I will pick stocks. I do it in, a, um, in, a, in an IRA. So I do it in kind of a tax advantage account. So if there's turnover, I don't have to pay taxes on it. Um, and yeah, my, my, my attitude is I would like to have an account where I can kind of scratch the itch, where I can explore this and I can, and I can continue to invest. Um, after COVID, um, I really considered just moving everything to the weird portfolio. Um, prior to that, I was doing more of like a deep value thing. Um, but then after really thinking about it, I decided, you know, I, I still want to pick stocks. I still want to try this and I still want to try to succeed at it. Um, and I, I modified my approach a little bit where now I'm, I'm more so looking for Warren Buffett kind of companies, companies with moats, companies with high returns on invested capital, companies that I can own for long periods of time. Um, whereas before, what I used to do is mostly buy stocks that were low P, low price to book, try to sell them quickly when I thought they reached intrinsic value. And now I'm looking more for companies that I can hold for a longer period of time. Excellent. Well, I hope you're good at it because two of your largest positions are two of my largest positions. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the first one is Alphabet. Um, you have a large selection uh, or large, you know, fairly large allocation to Alphabet. Uh, what, what do you like in Alphabet? Yeah. So what I decided 
in 2020 was that basically what I'm going to do instead of just screening the market and seeing what's cheap, I'm going to decide what I want to own while, while things are good. And then if they ever get to a price that I think is attractive, I'm going to buy them. So I started analyzing um, what I consider to be wonderful companies, which are companies with moats, high returns and in invested capital, um, some growth prospects where they can grow, um, the kind of companies that can generate significant amounts of free cash flow without um, taking on a lot of debt and a lot of risk, um, companies that had something to their economics that I thought was attractive long term. So Google was one of those companies. Um, Google's moat, I think, is pretty obvious. You know, you have search, um, you have Gmail, you have YouTube. These are institutions that probably aren't going to go away in the next 10 years. Um, if you use Google products, it's pretty much ingrained into your life. You aren't going to be able to get rid of your Gmail account easily. Um, you probably um, will always use Google search. There all, are alternatives like DuckDuckGo if you're worried about privacy. But um, having gone down that route and tried to use DuckDuckGo all the time, the results aren't particularly good. And I find myself well, you know, I don't really care. Google can know what I what I'm interested in. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, so that's a company with a moat. It's a company that can generate tremendous amounts of free cash flow. And uh, I added Google to my list a long time ago as, as, a, as one of the wonderful companies I'd like to own if it ever reaches a really attractive valuation. Um, and when the market started melting down um, this quarter, well, at least the tech sector, the QQQ kind of stocks, started melting down. I said, all right, well, this is probably my chance to swing at Google. Um, and when I saw it get near um, 20 times EV to EBIT, um, I knew that that was a valuation where it usually marked a floor in the past. So, and then in addition to that, I thought it was a decent free cash flow yield compared to um, treasuries and compared to the rest of the market. So I said, all right, this is my, this is my shot. So I, I bought Google. Um, and I plan on holding it for a long time. No, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I mean, I've held it for, for several years now, but like, um, like, and I do think it is at a, a very attractive valuation now, but just, I mean, like, I mean, they have like nine platforms with over a billion users, you know, from, from Gmail to YouTube to obviously search, but I mean, like they just have so many platforms with, with so many users. And, and I just, I just, I just have a hard time seeing their, uh, search being disrupted anytime soon. It just as they, you know, increase their market share and get more data about what people search and how people search, you know, they just increase their lead. And it's hard to, to find a moat that just grows almost like automatically like that. Yeah, I, I 100% agree. I think Google, I, I think Google is the best business in the world. Um, and it's probably going to stay that way for a long time. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the second one that we have in common is is Facebook or, or meta platforms now, even though it's going to be uh, quite a while before I get used to saying that. So what do you, uh, what do you like about Facebook? Yeah. So Facebook, um, I never imagined I would be able to buy it at a deep value price, but um, that happened this quarter and it fell to 10 times EV the EBIT. I never imagined in a million years that would ever happen, but it happened and started popping up in the value screens. Um, I had looked at Facebook a long time ago, assuming that I wouldn't be able to buy it at a value price for 20 years or something. And uh, it popped up in all of these screens. Um, Facebook is a wonderful company. It's um, when, you, when you strip everything away, it's basically advertising. Um, they can earn extremely high returns on invested capital. They can use data to um, enhance their advertising. So the way I look at it, Newspapers were basically a great business because they were advertising platforms, and now Google and Facebook are eating all of that up, um, and they're absorbing those tremendous businesses. Um, and I don't think that dynamic has changed. Like if you look at the daily users on Facebook, it's not really changing too much. Um, and then even if you're sour on Facebook's future prospects, like you think, um, you know, younger people aren't using it anymore, and they're all going to TikTok. Well. I guarantee you younger people are still on Instagram. Um, they're still using that platform pretty heavily. Um, and I personally tried to stop using Facebook a long time ago because of data concerns and everything like that. But 
Um, I noticed that I started to lose touch with some of my friends. Um, you know, I wasn't seeing, they would, I'd call them up and they'd say, oh yeah, I posted on Facebook. Uh, we had a baby six months ago, that type of thing. Right, and right, right. You, uh, do, you, you do lose touch with people if you're not on Facebook. So I think that's pretty ingrained in the culture at this point. Like I think um, people are going to, even if they're not posting every daily thought on Facebook, they're still going to be on there and it's still going to be a relevant platform. Um, in terms of why it's cheap right now, uh, people think Mark Zuckerberg has lost his mind because he's spending all this money on the metaverse. Um, my attitude about that is um, I thought Zuckerberg lost his mind in 2014 when he paid a billion dollars for Instagram, and that turned out to go pretty well. So I'm willing to give the guy the benefit of the doubt on the metaverse. Um, I realize it consumes a ton of cash, but that's said, even if Facebook went out and burned that cash and set it on fire. It would still be a great business. Right. Um, right. So, and I think it might work. Um, I, I suspect that a lot of the skepticism about are we going to use the metaverse and use virtual reality all the time? I suspect in 15 years, that's going to look kind of foolish. It's going to look like people in the mid 90s who were saying um, this internet thing is a fad and uh, nothing's going to happen with it. And who's going to go? you know, on the internet every day when you can just read a newspaper or <laughs> call someone. Um, I, I suspect the same is going to happen with the metaverse. Yeah, no, I think it, um, you know, as a shareholder for a long time, um, I think the metaverse can definitely work out. And, you know, it's funny what you said about Instagram, because like now, like that's being brought up to the FTC as an example of antitrust and, you know, how they might want to go back and like force a spinoff or, or who knows what. But like, for most of that time, since he bought Instagram, the main complaint was that like he spent way too much money. And now mm -hmm. it's like maybe one of the, you know, <laughs> it's up there with one of the greatest acquisitions of all time. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's a good point. Yeah. Every, I thought he was crazy when he did that. I'm like, why would you pay a billion dollars just to share pictures on the internet? This is stupid. Right, right, but right. Um, yeah, it, it turns out the guy knew what he was talking turns about. Out, yeah. He was pretty, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Um, would you have any concerns about like their engagement going down with like competitors like TikTok? Um, I think that they're different platforms. So I know that Facebook has um, their own like short video platform um, Ooh, right. that might be able to compete with it. Yeah, Reels. Um, so that's possible. But with that said, I just think they're two different animals. Like I think you log on to Facebook to share pictures of your wedding and your kids and interact with old friends. You're going on the Instagram to share pictures of your vacation or whatever. Um, I, I don't see people doing that on TikTok. I think it's its own thing. Um, and I don't necessarily think that it's going to take away from Facebook. The danger there with other platforms will be that it just basically reduces the amount of time that people spend on Instagram and Facebook. That seems like a, uh, like a small problem. Um, it doesn't seem like an existential threat to the company, whereas I think the market is acting now like TikTok is going to replace Facebook and Facebook is MySpace. And that just doesn't seem like reality to me. Sure, sure. No, I, I, I mean, I agree. Uh, and then finally, like the last company I wanted to talk about. Now, this one I actually wasn't familiar with at all before I was looking at your portfolio, but it's the Expeditors International of Washington, ticker EXPD. What does this company do? Yeah, so Expeditors, they're a third-party logistics company. So what that means is basically um, they move goods around the world and they use other companies, um, ships and planes and um, to move goods around the world. So basically a company can go to Expeditors and they can say, hey, I need to move something from um, Los Angeles to uh, you know, Vietnam. And basically what expeditors will be able to do with them, do for them is they'll be able to get it to wherever they need it to go on the time frame that they need it. Um, and they also have local offices set up all over the world where they can help you navigate customs. Um, they can help you um, navigate local um, transportation issues and um, they can get you, they can get your goods where they need to go. Um, it has a really good culture. So all the expeditors off offices are, are controlled by the local manager and the local ma manager gets um, 
that they get they get compensated for their ability to manage that office and they're given a lot of autonomy in managing it. Um, the company earns high returns on invested capital because they don't actually own the planes or the ships or anything else. Um, it's, it's a very capital light business. Um, and because of their global reach and, and their expertise in all of these different areas all over the world, it's a very difficult moat to breach. It's, it would be very hard if you started a third party logistics company to compete with expediters. Um, I think it would be difficult to, to unseat that. Um, during the recent um, market problems that we've had recently where the market's been crashing, um, Expeditors has fallen to a very attractive price. So the last time it was at these prices was like after the financial crisis, where right now it's uh, basically eight times EV the EBIT. Um, this is a company that tends to fall in and out of favor. So it's a um, in some environments, people will act like this is a hardcore compounder that's worth paying up for. Um, and then when there's a problem with global trade, it'll get very cheap again. So I've had it on my radar for a while, um, back in uh, 2021, I think it was 17 times EV the EBIT. Um, when I saw it fall to eight times, I said, well, this is, this is an excellent opportunity. I need to, uh, this is my chance to buy a wonderful company at a wonderful price. So I, I bought it. Excellent, excellent. Well, VSG, thanks so much uh, for coming on today. For people who are interested in following you and want to find out more about your style of investing and the weird portfolio, where can they find you? Sure. So um, the best place is Twitter. My handle is at Value Stock Geek. Um, on there, I post updates about my portfolio and about um, the weird portfolio as well. Um, on there, I have links to the weird portfolio. So you can go to um, my profile there. And I have a link to the book, The Weird Portfolio. I actually wrote a book about it. Um, and I put it up for free on Medium that anyone can go on and read if they're interested. Um, and then I have a Substack, um, valuestockgeek.substack.com, where I write about my active approach, where I'm talking about companies I'm buying and um, I'm doing write-ups on basically wonderful companies, companies that I think are exceptional, companies that I think have moats, and then um, I'm basically adding them to a watch list, and waiting for them to get to, to attractive levels. Yes. And, um, you know, I've been following you on Twitter for a while now, and um, I really enjoy your account. And even just this morning, as, as we're talking, I see you've like updated your portfolio on it and like, you know, just updated like your results for the quarter and just like your, your latest allocations to your individual socks and things like that. So he's definitely... Uh, you are definitely worth following on Twitter. Yeah, thank you. You as well. And thank you. Um, well, that'll be, that'll wrap it up today. Again, I'm Matthew Cochran. We're 7Investing, and we're here to empower you to invest in your future. Have a great day.